Hello and a warm welcome to Q&A. Tonight, as World Cup fever begins to engulf the nation, we bring you a special programme which gets under the skin of the world of football. It's a tale of two towns, of joy and of despair. Throughout the season, the people of both Halifax and Doncaster have been gripped by football fever, but for very different reasons. As the two clubs' fortunes have taken opposite directions and they have traded places in football's pecking order. Our story begins in Halifax five years ago. Anderson might look to nick this one in and it's chested down towards Hall. Rowbotham, Anderson, Rowbotham again, it's coming across the hall. And Derek Hall, a former Halifax Town player, scores the goal that could send his team out of the league. I remember the ball getting crossed in and I just happened to find myself in the penalty area and it came to me and I, I didn't actually hit it that hard whether that was in my mind or not I don't know and it, next thing I knew it hit the back of the net and it seemed a, like a deathly silence in the ground and some of my players came up to congratulate me and that's when it hit me then I actually felt drained at that time that I'd perhaps scored the goal that would send Halifax out of the league it was something I had to do I couldn't miss on purpose and but at the end of the day, I felt very drained and probably suffered as much as the Halifax people that day. They've still got to retain their composure while really throwing everything forward in the search for an equaliser. Patterson, and now surely Hardy! Well, you've got to feel sorry there for Jamie Patterson. He's played really well today, and I know there are some Football League scouts here who feel that they might pick up one or two bargains at the end of the season if Halifax do go out of the league. He is certainly one of them. To actually get relegated is bad enough, but to go out with the Football League, um, I mean, it's massive, and I felt, you know, solely responsible for it. It's all over. After 72 years, Halifax Town have lost their place in the Football League. The fans come on, but a goal by a former Halifax player, Derek Hall, has sent Halifax out of the league and maybe out of business altogether. we just won the game with Hereford, that was the last thought in my mind. My thought was to, perhaps I was going to have to live with this, the, the, the person that had scored the goal that sent Halifax out of the league. Um, at the time it was very emotional. I felt it that day like the people of Halifax felt it. It was a horrible day all round. Um, it had been building up for a long time. Feeling around the whole, the whole town was, it was just a horrible feeling. Um, and one that you never really want to experience again. It was probably one of the worst days of my life, along with maybe 7,000 people out there. They were all tears shed with bits of turf getting dug up and it was like administering the last rites. But Halifax did pick themselves up from that massive blow and play on in the GM Vauxhall Conference. Four years later though, they were on the brink of a far worse crisis, dropping down into an even lower league. With two games to go, Halifax were losing against Macclesfield Town, the conference leaders on their way into the Football League. But a fight back from 3-1 down to earn a point was to prove crucial. The task to get out of the conference, basically, uh, we totally underestimated um, the commitment of teams in the conference and the standard of football in the conference. We thought it was just a matter of we'll maintain the professional standards and we'll be up again the following year. Uh, nothing could have been further from the truth. On the very last day of that 1996-97 season, Halifax had to beat Steve Nishbera or face the unthinkable, a drop into the Unibond League. Former boss from the 70s, George Mulhall, had taken over as joint manager to ride the storm. It looked as if they had got a goal and got a draw, we were down. And we eventually scored in the last minute to make it 4-2 which it didn't matter then, we were definitely safe then. And there was a crowd invasion before the referee had blown the final whistle. So I think they thought the game was over. So yeah, I think the tears, the tears were in my eyes. It had been another amazing fight back. Halifax Town was safe for another year. But the manager took no part in the celebrations. He knew there was work to be done. 
we weren't playing very good football and we were conceding a lot of goals and obviously losing a lot of games. It was bad. It was really bad. In the Doncaster Rovers dressing room, things were even worse. To become a laughing stock, whether you like each other or not, is immaterial. There's plenty of good businesses got together with two people who didn't like each other, but they got the rest together. In the past, Rovers had struggled financially, but they'd always managed to keep their heads above water. The arrival of Ken Richardson as the new chairman in March 1993 was to prove a watershed. His story was literally one of rags to riches. In his hometown of Driffield, the multi-millionaire was known as Ragtag Richie. It said he made a million pounds on backing horses. The rest of his fortune was based on the manufacture of paper sacks. Some fans wondered whether his arrival at Bellevue was good news. Others believed that better times were around the corner. The majority of the fans were euphoric because for many years Doncaster had been struggling. Uh, the taxman had been at them, the batman had been there. They were having poor season after poor season and we were just lucky to finish mid-table. And along came this saviour in the form of Ken Richardson who was going to pay off all the debts, bringing a load of players for us and we were on our way to the first division, if not higher. The previous hierarchy for the past 15 years have totally alienated the club from the ordinary towns of people, supporters and business people, and there's been no communication. Rover's only asset, apart from the players, was the remaining 66 years of a 99-year lease on its ground at Bellevue. It's obviously a lucrative site, which could fetch its owners, Doncaster Council, millions of pounds if redeveloped. But fans were concerned when this appeared in the national broadsheets. We were rather uh, taken back because um, Mr Richardson advertised our land for sale in the Financial Times and indeed in the uh, Telegraph uh, without any kind of prior discussions with the councillors. So we took a rather uh, dim view of that, as you can imagine. Um, so that didn't help relationships between the parties. Links between the chairman and the council deteriorated. In June 1995, the main stand at Bellevue was minutes from being destroyed by fire. The fans were surprised when their chairman was charged with conspiracy to commit arson. He's due to stand trial in January at Sheffield Crown Court. But on the pitch, the news was better. Under manager Sammy Chung, it seemed Rovers did have a side capable of going places. Sammy had done a good job for us. I mean, with, until about the last six or eight weeks of this, the previous season, We've been challenging for promotion, but the start of the 96-97 season, we were in the sponsors' lounge before the game. We'd spoken to Sammy Chung before two o'clock, and Sammy Chung was at that time the manager of Doncaster Rovers. And about half an hour before kickoff, Ken Richardson came into the sponsors' lounge and announced to us that he'd dismissed Sammy Chung and that we'd got Kerry Dixon as the player manager. Uh, we were, we were aghast. We, we didn't know what was going on because to, to fire your manager half an hour or an hour before the new football league season kicks off, uh, it's a pretty unheard of thing. And there's your granddad's football team there. Yeah, where's There's granddad? your granddad there. He looks a bit like him. Well, it would look a bit like him, darling, wouldn't it? Yeah. My father played for Doncaster Rovers just after the war. He loved the club as much as I do. Doncaster Rovers versus Werder Bremen. 1969. And German World Cup players in that side, and we could beat them in those days. I remember going about seven years ago with him, and Rovers had a gate of about 2,600, and he turned to me and said, when I played, we used to get more here for the reserve games. And it just shows that over the years that the club has gone backwards. Under Kerry Dixon, Doncaster Rovers struggled. They spent most of his first season flirting with relegation but eventually managed to pull themselves clear. However, the Omens were not looking good last summer, with debts totalling over a million pounds. The administrators were called into Bellevue. In the build-up to their new season, Halifax played their neighbours Huddersfield Town, and won. The performance left the manager, the team captain and the supporters full of hope. Captain Peter Jackson was to make his mark both on the field 
and behind the scenes. I thought, you know, I started pre-season then that there were good teams for it and the lads and I, I thought it was really important that the club started well and we played Huddersfield in a pre-season friendly and beat them 2-1 and played really well and I thought after that result that we had a great chance of uh, being champions that year. I think some of our supporters thought the same because the betting was 66-1 to and after that Huddersfield game the betting went to 51 overnight so I think a few of the supporters thought the same. I obviously didn't think what was going to happen that's happened but I thought we'd do a lot better than we did last year. By late September the optimism appeared justified. League Town were the next visitors, Halifax were unbeaten in the conference, the supporters were coming back and the money was certainly coming in. The results continued to go Halifax Town's way. Two well on the night, Halifax went to the top of the conference table. Amidst all of this, Peter Jackson remained a key and influential part of a momentum which was to carry the whole town with it. I said, uh, as soon as Halifax hit the top of the league, I'm going to put the flag out. We've been a lifelong supporter. You know, not having been so often. I thought, right. The flag's going out as soon as we top of the league. The only regret I have, I didn't put money on them this time. They were 66 to 1 to go up and I never put anything on them. I've seen them play this field in their pre-season friendly and that got me going, oh, so good then. So I've got a £10 one there for a straight win and a £5 each way. So if we, if we finish top, I've got £1,100 to come there. But with confidence at a peak, Peter Jackson accepted a better offer to become manager of Huddersfield Town. His departure could have blown apart the Halifax dream. I had it written in the contract with, with the chairman and George there uh, that if a club came in for me in a coaching or manager in general capacity, they'd let me go. So, uh, you know, it could have been it could have been after three games, but uh, it was after ten games. Well, I knew that he was a big influence and uh, he kept the back four solid, or the back three solid, and I felt we needed somebody with character to continue in that position. And, uh, I mean, the story's well known now that I got a phone call from a plumber who mentioned Brian Klein, and my answer was, I don't, you don't mean the Brian Klein that played at Wembley with Coventry? He said, yeah, same man. So I got his phone number and rang him up, and he came in and trained with us. It was in 1987 that Brian Kilcline lifted the FA Cup for Coventry. In 1997, Killer came out of retirement to play for Halifax. Well done, lad. With Kilcline, the winning streak continued. It appeared a crisis had been averted. Doncaster Rovers, on the other hand, were heading for a major catastrophe. They conceded 13 goals in their first two home games of the season, scoring none in reply. As time went on, we, were, we didn't even look like winning a game. I mean, we were lucky to get nil in some games. We were so dire. We spoke to Kerry Dixon, and Kerry was extremely despondent. Uh, there was no money to spend. The, the club was virtually a rudderless ship. In an attempt to steady that ship, Dixon called upon the services of former Bellevue hero Jim Dobbin, a veteran of close on 400 league games. Yeah, then I wanted by the results, so I hoped to go there and make a bit of a difference. So I went in on the Monday to train. Tuesday, <laughs> Kerry, got, Kerry got the sack, and I, I ended up uh, signing there for, for the rest of the season. That's when it started. <laughs> The club say that Dixon, once an England striker, remember, wasn't sacked. They simply couldn't afford to keep him. He was paid off. I spoke to reporters in June of last year, and I couldn't come out publicly and say it, and I said, it'll be a miracle if I, if I fulfil the fixtures. It'd be a double miracle if we finish 91st in the league, because that was the best, very best we were ever going to hope for. Jim Dobbin's first match was at Macclesfield, where they lost again. With Dixon out of the frame, Chairman Ken Richardson picked the team and decided the tactics. I must admit it was a totally different team talk than I'd ever encountered, you know, and um, I 
I couldn't believe some of the <laughs> some of the, the tactics that he was wanting to use, but as I say, that's another story, isn't it? <laughs> The 3-0 defeat was hard enough to bear, but the sight of Richardson on the bench was too much for one Rovers supporter. As the team became anchored to the foot of the table, many others tried their hand in the dressing room. I think everybody but Mickey Mouse has had a go this season, really, and I think he might have done a better job than some of them. We started off with Kerry Dixon, and he was replaced, let me get this right, because we've had that many, it's just a matter of trying to recall who came next. Uh, the next one was Colin Richardson, if my memory serves me right, and he seemed to be in and out, and then he left, and, and for a little while we had um, Dave Cowling. You've got to be cute with him. If it's coming straight at him and it's, it's a decent fight for him, you've got to come to the side. <coughs> Dave was the youth team manager there, and he, he was like myself, he played professional, and he, he was really good. He was the best coach there. It was going pretty well, and I think his third game, he got interference from above and he said that he wasn't having anything to do with the team then and um, that was the beginning of the end basically That's good! Get up! That's a free kick! Cowling stepped down because the club had already decided to appoint Danny Bagara, a Uruguayan born coach with 25 years worth of experience but the fans patience was wearing extremely thin Danny's been shouted at, he rang me up on the Monday he said, Mark, I'm not prepared to be manager of the team and be ridiculed like that. I'll help you out on the coaching, but I'm off. But I'd already threatened. I said, if we get rid of him, it's pointless for me appointing anybody else. I will become manager. It's as simple as that. If you're going to have a different attitude, a different attitude than sometimes you have, where you've missed the offside, you've missed not, this and that. We then had Mark Weaver, uh, who said he would take control of things. Uh, and we all know that, of course, when you sell lottery tickets for Stockport County Football Club it gives you a wealth of Football League experience to take on board the trials and tribulations of managing a Football League club. As a person I didn't particularly dislike him but I didn't I didn't think he had much idea on football. I was just lucky enough to win my first game in charge. <laughs> and that must have seemed like winning the lottery for a man with no Football League experience. The win came at the 24th attempt against Chester but only 864 fans saw it. Rose had made the worst ever start by a league club. That was great, you know, I mean, even supporters thought we'd won the cup, you know, because we beat Chester and it, it was a, a good achievement, you know, but as I say, it was just all coming too late. We knew that the supporters were very unhappy with what was going on because it was understandable. And um, as a player, I mean, we didn't know whether we were coming or going. You know, I mean, you, did, you didn't know if you were playing or what was going on. There was no organisation. I was on appearance money, and it later come out that that's why they wouldn't play me is because if they played me, I'd get this appearance money and. Nobody likes getting left out, but when you were getting left out for non-league players, it, it just, it wasn't easy, you know, it wasn't easy. When I first went, there were maybe half a dozen professionals, the rest were just non-league players, and gradually they were whittling away at that half a dozen, you know, and obviously there were players coming in, playing one or two games, and then they were gone, so there were no team spirit in the dressing room. If I know I've only got £4,000 to spend, in one week and I've already spent it on other things floodlights, repairs, ground repairs, lawn mower needs fixing, grass seed, whatever the groundsman wants something, coach for an away game if I've already spent the £4,000 I couldn't afford to go over that budget that was an impossibility because at the end of every month I had to go back to the administrators and say I've got a clean ship can we go on for another month? Rovers had been rooted to the bottom of the third division since the first month of the season and were making schoolboy errors. The fans had had enough. We were seeing that the club was facing extinction, not just, not just sort of relegation from the Football League, which is bad enough, but extinction of Doncaster Rovers. And for a club that's been around since 1879, that was something we didn't want to see happen. Good evening ladies and gentlemen, 
sorry for the late start. Um, first of all, can I welcome everybody to tonight's meeting. It's very hard to keep the momentum going for Save the Rovers at the moment. There seems to be nothing happening and all you're reading about is doom gloom and in spite of Shrewsbury, more heavy defeats. Our aim was to bring the plight of Doncaster Rovers to the footballing public. Not that we were a bad side that was going to go down, but being pushed out by the owners. Look, I've supported Rovers for 40 odd years. We've never had any luck at Bellevue. Uh, I mean, I love the place, but we've never had any luck. It might be the best thing since for us to ever happen to move from there and start again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He can hire and fire his players. He can't hire and fire the supporters. And if we pay our money and go into the ground, we're entitled to voice our opinion. And if that is, he's shouting for Richardson and his crew to go, that's fine. But he didn't like that at all. And he couldn't stand that. And he was determined to show who was the boss of Doncaster Rovers. On the 4th of October, the fans claimed partial victory when Richardson left Bellevue at half-time, never to be seen again on match days. He was still the boss, and now the fans vented their wrath on his right-hand man, Mark Weaver. It's upsetting to sit there, and I, and I took it and I stayed there, and I, I went to every game. I honestly felt, and I still feel like, I've done nothing wrong. All I did was want to keep Duncan Strovers in business. I don't believe any, anybody else could have done any more. That's the worst ever league crowd they got. They got 1,100 against Scarborough, but Scarborough brought over 600. The takeover seemed the fans' only hope, and Essex nightclub owner Anton Johnson, a man who'd had controversial reigns himself at both Rotherham United and Southend United, seemed the most likely to acquire Ken Richardson's majority shareholding at Bellevue. And really, we are still very, very keen to get hold of Rovers. Johnson headed just one of many business consortia who were said to be interested and at one point it was even reported that a deal had been completed. It was two or three years at the club and we just never believed that there would be any takeover at any time. I personally never, you know. I, I, I read the paper every night and it was this Irish consortium, Anton Johnson, somebody in Australia, and I, I just never believed there would be a takeover at any time. I hoped there would be, but I never believed it. By Christmas, when Rotherham were the visitors, Rovers were nine points adrift of their nearest rivals, Brighton. They'd played 27 games and conceded 71 goals. They didn't get many favours from Santa Claus either. We were due to play Mansfield on Boxing Day, which would have been a decent crowd. All of a sudden, from having maybe 20,000, 18,000 pounds, because Boxing Day invariably was a good day, we have the unluckiness of having our roof blown off the night before. The, the game has to be postponed. Everybody else is saying, oh, he's done this, he's done that. What they didn't realise is, well, they're all having a good time on, on Boxing Day night. I'm sat there scratching my head wondering, where am I going to get the money from to keep Doncaster Rovers going in business? Three days later, the shell-shocked Doncaster players travelled down to London to play Leighton Orient. Looking back at the season, certain results stick in your mind and, and that was definitely one because um, Matt Weaver, his team talk before that game was uh, we're making you all part time. Where is all this crap coming from that you've come from? I'm not blaming that on the, purely on the result but it didn't help, it didn't help. For Rovers in the yellow away strip it was to be their worst league defeat in 95 years. A couple of young boys made their debuts there and under these circumstances it was impossible, you know. Smith for three. Yeah! Yes it is! And Doncaster know it's another black away day. They knew they could score at will. I mean they were scoring, I think it was about every eight minutes. But it runs through there almost. This could still be Richards. Oh, he's missed it. Now he has him. 4 nil. Doncaster have capitulated. Just a nightmare. That's a good run from Ling. Beautiful foot control. Richards with a chance, and it's seven. 
I think if Leighton had hadn't backpedalled towards the end of the game, then it would have gone into double figures. Easily. This is Baker, with a chance to make it eight. And he has! It's equal the record! Restrictions were put on us by the administrators. They, they told us that is what you pay, and that is it. And if you don't pay at the end of the month, then we will wind the football club up. So, was it better to lose 8-0 at Leighton Orient and still have a football club in January, or do we spend something we haven't got, still get beat maybe 3 or 4-1, and not have a football club in January? I've heard supporters say they'd rather not have a football club, it's an embarrassment. I don't believe that. Well, I know personally, I just, I would, I just wanted to get out of the place, you know, I just wanted to, to get back on the bus and, and home, you know, try and forget about it. to report training on the Tuesday and when I went in on the Tuesday to, to training there were only five players turned up and I had made my mind up that was me I, I was I, I'd had enough you know what I mean whatever they were going to offer me I, I was happy to take just to leave you know you got five minutes into that trip to go in eh Jim Dobbin wasn't the only one to leave in March the remaining coaches apart from Danny Bagara were released those players that remained were heading for the Vauxhall Conference at best. When Colchester, Darlington and Lincoln came out, the conference wasn't as strong as it is now. You want to look at Stevenage, Morecambe, the ground and the setups they've got there. It's a better setup than there's ever been here under, this, under Richardson's regime. And we will go, if we go to the conference... That goes back further than Richard's yeah. regime, nothing well, being listen, done here. Listen, don't tell me anything about debt. I was here long before you ever came. Well, look around you at the car park. Why has the car park never been the done? It's been done loads of times. This, this time. has been done. It's been done Can you actually time. believe this has ever been done? It's been done loads of times. Yeah. Done is concreting properly fifty thousand pounds so done. it never gets into it's this state. Well, I can assure you, you Manchester United's car park well, does not end up like this. Why it has fifty thousand people something. Not much had been spent on Halifax Town's ground either. If the club was to remain top of the conference, the Shea Stadium in this state would certainly not meet football league requirements and Halifax Town would not be promoted. We won a few games early season, uh, but having been connected with Halifax Town for quite a period of time, uh, things have a habit of going wrong. Um, and we, we won a few games and we were there and there about the table. Highest we'd ever been in the conference since in only five years. But all the time we're sort of thinking it's probably a flash in the pan, a bit of a fluke. Then it got to November, and we were still consistently winning games and uh, we went to the top of the table. Success had brought the fans flooding back and they were prepared to travel miles to watch a winning team. This is the best team in my opinion, the best football team that I've ever had in my time. Yeah. We were there yeah. when they went on a Tuesday night in October, Morecambe welcomed the biggest crowd so far this season in the conference. There were 3,940 people in the ground, the figure swelled by the growing army of over 2,000 Halifax faithful. 
support that we took over there was absolutely fantastic. Um, football league clubs want to take that support over there, and that's one of the reasons that, that's why we've won the league because of the support this season, away from home especially. I think it all comes about by word of mouth. People come and watch us play, they played well. We go back and tell the boy next door or the boy in the pub. They say, well, we'll go and have a look at that. And they come and they like what they see. So two midfield players and they'll play three up front. That's the system there. We'll have to work hard. If we don't, these are a good side. Striker Jeff Horsfield was scoring for fun. His goal that night secured a one-all draw for Halifax. They remained top of the table. But if success had attracted the fans, it also meant that the plan to develop the Shea over the coming months had taken on a new urgency. The thing is that we're going to need to move the pitch in a, nor in a northern direction fairly quickly. Um, now, how soon we'll be able to actually play on that surface really is down to yourself. And, and we can do a temporary move yeah. up to Pallet Sim, so it allows you room at the, at the south southern end. The plans were discussed in a porter cabin inside the Shea. In the porter cabin next door, the manager, while conscious of the need for results on the field, watched them slowly taking shape. The ground was dead like them in the the running track's not been used for how many years? 20 years, I think. The terrace and at the far end going at the time was redundant. It was a mess. The ground development that, to be truthful, should have been finished for the beginning of the, this last season suddenly took on enormous uh, significance. And what if we do finish top and, and we can't go up because of, as, as Macclesfield and Kidderminster and Stevenage found out, the ground wasn't up to scratch. Where are we going to be? Football league rules dictate that a club coming into the league must have a ground meeting the necessary criteria by the end of March. They're now up against the clock. The eagerly awaited new south stand of the Shea Stadium hardly warranted the name. It was a nightmare. Um, every morning you get up, you look at the weather, you turn. The, the Yorkshire weather forecast on the uh, radio weather forecast on what have you to try and see if snow was forecast for the next three months and what have you but uh, yeah that's say we were lucky and luck on the pitch held out too As the team increased the gap at the top of the conference, the builders worked against the clock around the players. <laughs> Pete, that's your shovel, use it. Right. Great line, lad. You want to put it in the middle? Personally, uh, I don't think I'd have ever been forgiven had the ground not been done because, uh, you know, my neck was in the noose for that. At the beginning of April, officials from the Football League arrived to inspect the Shea. Their decision would determine whether or not Halifax Town's ground was fit for the league. They were shown the brand new terracing which the club was now confident it could fill with fans. Yeah, it's looking really well, John. It takes me back to the old days where we used to uh, stand up here Especially when there was yeah. 35,000 crowds right. when you played uh, Spurs. Spurs, yeah. that's right. A good run up to there. That's right. Snow yeah. on the ground that day as well, wasn't it? Yeah, it was, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say, it would be a nice idea just to see the turnstiles and the, the, end, the exit and everything, because that's part of the capacity. The Football League can confirm that Halifax Town have met all the necessary ground criteria by the 1st of April deadline to gain entry into the Football League. Therefore, should Halifax Town 
win the Vauxhall Conference Championship, they will be promoted to Division 3 of the Football League for next season. George refused champagne on that day, he was offered a glass and uh, in, in, in true Caledonian spirit he refused it because we'd won nothing yet. Um, it was all down to him and I think the pressure then increased on George to win games. Everybody was drinking champagne and I thought, no, I don't want to be seen on television drinking champagne before they got promoted. I, mean, I am very cautious, me. I've always been that way. But once something's achieved then you get plenty of smiles and I'm a very happy man then. But I've been around a long time and I've been involved in promotion fights and relegation fights too often to get carried away. Ask them to move up, move along, rather than just sitting on the edges and leaving the, mid the middle bit open, all right? And you ask them to move along so we can get the people in. And the fans were coming in their droves. With nine games to go, the stewards at Halifax prepared to welcome a record crowd for a conference game at the Shea. A crucial match too against their nearest rivals. The big turning point was Rushton and Diamonds at home where we'd been beaten 4-0 down there and shown ourselves up. We'd had a player sent off, we'd had several booked uh, and it was a nightmare at Rushton. Uh, we couldn't wait to get out of the ground. And to be faced with playing them, who we were in second place at that time at home, and knowing that so much rested on that result, uh, the adrenaline was just so high among every, everyone concerned with it. We owed Rushton and Diamonds one because we went down there and got beat 4 0. We knew that they want four goals better than us, so we had a point to prove when they came down to the Shea. Pencil cases, 199. Get your blue and white wig, 350. They were the sort of contenders to us for the league and uh, we played very well against them. All of our players were up for that game. The score was 2-0 to Halifax, which was one of their best performances of a memorable season. If I, my mind wandered to winning it then, it was after we beat Rushton 2-0. That was the game that gave me the most delight. Personally, the adrenaline was so high, I couldn't sleep on the Saturday night following the game, nor the Sunday night after. Um, just stayed awake, I was just so elated <coughs> with the whole sequence of events. By now, Halifax were well clear of all their rivals. So far ahead, in fact, that with four games to go, victory against Kidderminster Harriers, away from home, mind you, would see them crowned champions. After today, the boys are back. Come on, Shimon. <laughs> Wait a long time for this. 28 years since we last went to. It was absolutely brilliant. I mean, you know, he come out with the, the tunnel at the Kidderminster and see everybody waving the flags and you know singing. And I felt exactly the same way as they did because I'm a supporter, of, you know, of the club as well. But somebody out there likes you, George. They had missed a penalty. Nine times out of ten, they're going to score their penalty kick. And I just felt it was our day. The next goal would seal the championship and fulfil a dream. When I was out sitting in the dugout, when he cut in on his right foot, and I'm sort of talking to myself and I'm saying don't shoot with your right foot from there Jamie and what is he doing? He hits it with his right foot and it screams in I mean he's not the best with his right foot. But yeah I've scored it a few times again in my dreams.
when we got relegated, I said that my ambition was to get them back into the Football League, but they actually scored one of the goals that's actually put us back into the league. You can't have the script any better. And the final whistle, every jubilant Halifax supporter wanted to join the party. Champions, we won it. Get that champagne on. Doncaster's fans were also on their pitch, but for vastly different reasons. They knew their club was on the brink of relegation. A pitch invasion stopped the match against Hull City. If their nearest rivals Brighton beat Scunthorpe, Rovers would have to win to keep their season alive. They left it to the very last minute. When we won the last game against Hull City, we've forgotten forgotten what to do when we scored a goal and we won at the end of the game. It's been so it's been so long and so rare. Uh, yeah, it was great. It was great to, to actually win a game and get three points. The tension that had built up between the players and supporters finally reached breaking point. Realistically, we knew we were down. I mean, miracle upon miracles uh, if we'd stayed in the league, but it wasn't going to happen. There was just no way was it going to happen. Um, it just prolonged the agony for another week. It was just going to finish in disaster, and it did. With five games to go and only four matches won all season, Rovers knew only a win would do, and only then if others lost. The team that travelled to Chester City was largely made up of Doncaster youth players. Hey, come on, well it's life is still holding on. Let's fucking make sure that we go as far as we can possibly can and if possible make the miracle happen. All the best to you all. Alright, anybody from now and um, before quarter past two that don't quite fancy it, please let me know. And, uh, and then I'll put somebody else. Alright. I've never really thought about going down yet. You know, I know it's a possibility, but I haven't. It hasn't really sunk in that we, you know, we can go down today. Now, now that it counts, we go and do it now for 90 minutes. Don't be thinking tomorrow morning in your bed. Fucking hell! If I'd have given a bit more, we'd still be in the league. It's no fucking good thinking about it then. It's today, in it, all of us, eh? And we can do it. Hey, we've had it all season against us. We've run up against it. It's pride anyway, in it. Pride more than anything. If we go down, come on. Come on, come on, come on. fucking careers as well because no fucker will watch you after today if you battle and win this fucker today your momentum might get you through the next four the crowd at the home and the momentum might get you through the four games and you'll have proved the biggest miracle ever in football or do you just want to fucking toss it off against that is that what you want to go out of the league to or wouldn't you rather if you're going to go out it might be fucking Knox County who are a bit of class or do you want it to be Chester City who are fucking awful what do you want You've got something to fucking fight for. You've got 45 minutes.
well done, lad. Well played. Oh, you're not with commitment. You're playing against the whole fucking season. We've been up against it, boys, and it's not down to you, lot. All right. It was so upsetting, really. It was hard to talk about, and it, it still is hard to talk about that the row was losing the league status. But we could still pick the paper up and look and see Nationwide League Division 3 and see Doncaster Rovers there. So we were still in the league, and it wasn't really until the last game of the season when we played Colchester, which was a very emotive day for all of us, that we finally realised that this was it. This was the last game that we were playing in the Football League. This is just like nothing that a professional's ever been through before. Nothing. I mean, um, if I do go into play non-league or whatever, I'm sure it'll be probably better run than that. Hopefully one day the fans will realise that I did keep the football club alive and I might be able to show my face again in Doncaster one day. Out of every bad thing, something good has got to come. And hopefully the good is Richardson and Weaver and Deanard going from Doncaster Rovers and giving our club back to us and giving it to people who want to make something of Doncaster Rovers. Town to be to be playing football league again means everything to you know I mean another side as well in Yorkshire now that are competing at a football league level and that's where Halifax belong and I'm sure that's where they'll stay. It's a great chance for them now to be back in the league. It's important to get investment to get back in uh, to make it a stronger club than it was last time. actually win the league and actually get the ground on at the same time is a magnificent achievement um, and, and George has done a fantastic job. It's a big thing for Halifax to get back in the football league. I mean everybody's pointing to George Mulhall but I think the credit goes to the players. It's just been an unbelievable season. Uh, anyone who said at the beginning of the season that Halifax Town would win the Champions come May, who would have believed it? 66 to 1 at the beginning. Thank you, Chairman. Yep. It's just been fairy tale stuff. But it just shows that anyone can do it. That was the last in the current series of Q&A, but the programme returns in the autumn.